We are delighted to have several of our new students here today. Uh, we've got incoming freshman Cameron Walkup, incoming transfer students Jessica Davis and Emily Duckworth, and incoming grad student Anna Maldonado. And each will come and speak, and I told them you were very nice people and would support them, so give them a round of applause. Hello, my name is Cameron Walkup. I am an incoming freshman, a member of the Honors College, and a Sondheim Public Affairs Scholar. In May, I graduated from Wooten High School in Rockville, Maryland, where I was a part of the Humanities and Arts Signature Program, a member of the ice hockey team, and the lighting designer for our theatrical productions, in addition to being a Boy Scout for 12 years and a member of two youth uh, theatrical productions. In addition, uh, here, sorry, here at UMBC, I plan to study a combination of environmental studies and theater design and production, and hope to eventually take on the accelerated master's degree program in public policy. As a part of the UMBC community, I hope to be involved in several theatrical productions, as well as play some recreational sports and participate in the Student Government Association, which is actually having a retreat in a few hours, so if the speaker's after me, it could be kind of fast so I can run along to that. That would be very helpful. <laughs> In all honesty, it wasn't until the end of my junior year that I even began to think of UMBC as a choice for me in my college search. Before that, I had always seen myself following my brother's footsteps and going to UMBC's own older brother, College Park. But after a UMBC admissions counselor visited my school, I toured campus multiple times and started to receive what seemed like daily mailings in my mailbox, I realized that UMBC had everything I wanted in a school. While I could stand here and list every single positive aspect about UMBC, the thing that stood out to me the most was the way that it really seems to focus about its students and care about them. Whether it's the way that it has such a renowned focus on undergraduate teaching, or its intense push for students to network, do original research, and complete internships, or that it actually has air conditioning in each and every residential hall, it's clear, <laughs> it's clear that this university cares unlike any other. <laughs> another, part, another aspect that drew me to UMBC was its incredible programs, such as the two I'm a part of, namely the Honors College and the Sondheim Public Affairs Scholars Program. The Honors College promises to provide me with opportunities to maintain the high level of academic rigor that I experienced throughout my high school career while also helping me find my place within the school through the LLC. In addition, the Sondheim Program gives me the chance to pursue my desire to serve my community in whatever way I can. Whether it's being a leader in my Boy Scout tree, troop or numerous theatrical companies, I've always enjoyed being a leader in my community and as such, I look forward to service and leadership opportunities as a Sondheim Scholar and as a newly named Eagle Scout. My hope is to graduate from UMBC and go on to find work advocating for the protection of our environment, whether from inside a government organization like the EPA or with a conservation group like the Sierra Club. And thanks to the amazing staff and faculty members here at UMBC, as well as the Sondheim and Honors College programs, I know I'll be well situated to find my place in the world once I leave in just a few short years. While I had originally disregarded this college as just some state school out near Baltimore, it has truly revealed itself to be a hidden gem for my future classmates and I. I cannot wait to move in on Saturday, become part of the UMBC community, and hopefully get to know you all very well soon. Thank you. Hello everyone, how are you today? All right, that's great. So my name is Jessica Davis. I am from Prince George's Community College. I am also a T-Site Scholar, which is Transfer Students in Information Technology and Engineering. I'm part of the CWIT family. Go CWIT. All right. <laughs> so today, I'm going to talk to you about my story, about why I chose UMBC, and my future plans. So as far as my story, I was really su successful in high school. I came in from Oxon Hill High School. I was part of the science and tech program, and I was part of many art societies, like the National Art Society, and the English Honor Society, and the Math Art Society. I even graduated top 5% of my class. But the only problem was, even with all my accolades and my high test scores and all of those things, I just didn't have enough money. I'm, and I'm sure I'm not the only, per only student that's had that issue. So I decided that I'll just attend Prince George's Community College. They offered me a scholarship for four semesters. It was called the Board of Trustees Legacy Scholarship. And after I graduated from PGCC, I decided to join the TSA program here and the CWIT program. So as far as why I chose UMBC, 
Well, from the very first college tour, I did hear I could really feel my that feel that sense of belonging. Like I could see myself working on a really hard programming project in the library. I could see myself going to a play at the at the performing arts building. I could see myself in my dorm room studying with friends. And as and I really felt and I really liked the environment. I liked how you really place an emphasis on diversity, place an emphasis on studying and making the world a better place in research and I really like the family environment too since there's a since U UMBC is a relatively mid-sized university, I felt I wouldn't have a very hard time like meeting people who are, who are like me and dislike me, who are people who are diverse, who are, aren't as diverse. I could feel myself being able to meet all sorts of different kinds of people and being, and being able to connect with them in different ways. And for the last, very last reason, I like dogs. <laughs> I really like the mascot here. I'm like, go dogs. I am so excited for the puppy furry. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I'm not done yet. Okay. I've got one more section for you, all right? All right. So I'm going to keep it short and to the point. My future plans. For the short term, I plan on graduating with a bachelor's in information systems with the certification in web development. And for my long term, I plan on enlisting in AmeriCorps, FEMA, or VISTA and joining the workforce afterwards and start off as a system administrator or a junior programmer and become a director of information technology. Since I'm a big nerd, I'm going to shoot for Bethesda over in Bethesda, Maryland and, and try to, you know, become a director of information technology and see, like, the games come to life in my own way. So I'm really happy that you guys were here to help hear me speak. I'm really happy that you guys were chose me to speak. I hope you guys have a really great day, and thanks for having me. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Duckworth, and I'm an incoming transfer student from Frederick Community College. At the beginning of my last year at FCC, when I first began the transfer process, I had three initial criteria that I needed to see in a transfer school before I would even really consider it as a possibility. Um, first, the school needed to be located in the state of Maryland, because who wants to pay out-of-state tuition costs? Second, it needed to have a strong social work program. <laughs> and lastly, although it's slightly unusual, but my transfer school needed to be in close proximity to um, an archery range, <laughs> which would allow me to continue training for local, regional, national, and international competitions. What I did not realize at the, oh, sorry. Coincidentally, I found UMBC was one of a few schools which could check off all of those criteria. What I did not realize at the time was how important those unspoken criteria were. I subconsciously knew I needed in a transfer. Hmm. Uh, once I started attending campus visits, I grew aware of my desires for a school with a beautiful campus, welcoming atmosphere, a school with friendly students, passionate faculty, and helpful staff members. And most importantly, I wanted a school which could help me strive for new academic, career, and social goals. From the first time I set foot on campus, I knew UMBC met and exceeded all of those criteria. In fact, I remember vividly telling my mom after my first campus visit that our search was over. UMBC was the transfer school for me. I remember being so impressed by the school's honors program, by the diversity in the student body, and by how active the whole campus is in social justice issues. Now as I prepare to begin my first semester here, I'm excited to meet new friends, ready to further my education in social work and political science, and I am thrilled beyond belief I get to do it at a school that I already love. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Maldonado. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I'm from Santa Ana, California. Southern California, yes, Orange County people. <laughs> um, a little bit about my city because I think that just paints a, a pretty good picture of where I come from. Uh, my city is overwhelmingly 
Hispanic. Uh, most of the people there are either me Mexican immigrants themselves or children of Mexican immigrants with a couple of Central Americans, but mostly Mexican immigrants. Um, it is basically little Mexico. A lot, you go anywhere and everything is in Spanish. Little print is in English, so that's, that's where I grew up. Um, the majority of the city is also living below the poverty line. Uh, most uh, of the Mexican immigrants are, um, don't have too much education, so most of us are first generation. Um, so that's sort of my city. Uh, it also sort of describes my experience. I am, my par both of my parents are Mexican immigrants. Um, my, neither of my parents had any schooling, so my mom actually doesn't know how to read or write. My dad taught himself how to read and write. Um, and the same thing is true for my grandparents. Uh, my grandma, my paternal grandmother, is literate only because her father thought that it would be important for her to know how to read the Bible. Only reason. But otherwise, they also did not go to school. Um, so with that said, I see education as a really big privilege that I have. Uh, every step in my educational experience has been a success for not only myself, but for my family. I really see it as a family accomplishment. Uh, grade school was obviously an accomplishment. Kindergarten, we were talking about this, is a, is a great accomplishment. That celebration at the end of kindergarten is super important. Um, and so I, I went to undergrad at Princeton, and now I'm here as a first year a graduate student in the psychology department with Dr. Murphy. Yes. Um, and so I, for me, it's really a privilege to be here. Uh, for, I really, like I said, I see it through my family's eyes. And to think of basically zero schooling to PhD is, in one generation for me, is something that I'm really proud of. And I know that my family is very proud of. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about how I got to UMBC. Um, so last, not well, yeah, it was last summer. Yes, last summer, um, I I tend to to plan ahead a lot because I I know coming from my background, being low income, first generation, that I have to sort of plan ahead to sort of keep up with everyone else. So I, you know, I, I do a lot of things where I look up things online and I try to make sure I keep a list of opportunities that are in the near future. Um, so I, I learned about the Leadership Alliance and UMBC is actually one of the universities that's part of the Leadership Alliance. And I had applied and you were supposed to find out some time, I guess it was like April or something, and then they had like a cap last deadline. Like if you haven't heard back from anyone, then you definitely didn't get in. And there is like a two week, it was almost two weeks until I got there, and I started freaking out because I really knew the importance of research, having research experience before graduate school. And so I decided, okay, I'll be proactive. So I called Dr. Murphy and we had a discussion to see if we would be a good match. Um, I'm interested in intimate partner violence and that's what his re research is in. So he was actually the only person in the Leadership Alliance Consortium that studied intimate partner violence. So he was sort of my only hope. And so I contacted him and he said, great. And I thought, okay, good. So he said you know, he would be willing to push forward my application so that I could come here for the summer. And so then I contacted Justine, and so she's the director, coordinator for the Leadership Alliance um, here. And so then I contacted her and she said, well, we don't have any funding, so actually th it's not gonna work out. That's why we didn't accept students. And so then I said, okay, well, what if I can try to find funding? Will you let me come? And so she said yes. And Princeton fortunately had a, uh, it was like a summer, it was through some uh, federal work study. They do a summer thing where they will pay you and then the, the program just needs to compensate uh, Princeton. So then Princeton said, yes, we'll do it. And then it all worked out. And, and there I was doing research with Dr. Murphy and, uh, and I loved it, I loved it. And so he encouraged me to apply to graduate school. I applied here into several other programs I got into several other programs as well, but then I ultimately decided to come here because I just felt more at home. A diversity being a really big key in it, um, I knew that 
it was a very diverse campus. I was really impressed by how diverse it was compared to Princeton. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that, that, and obviously um, Dr. Murphy's amazing, so that he was also a main, main reason why I decided to come here. But everyone that I met at interviews was, they were all very, very lovely people. And so um, it's just, it's been, a, it's been a great experience so far. I've only really been here for a while, but I already feel like I'm, I'm at home. Um, and so in terms of future plans, um, I want to become a professor. I really truly believe in the idea that your diverse experience can contribute to the advancement of knowledge in whatever field it is that you are in. Um, and so that is something that I want to push forward as a professor. And also just be an example for um, students of color or students who are low income or first generation to, to know that that is something that they can actually accomplish. So thank you. Give them all one more round of applause. You can go back to the table if you want to. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Very inspiring. We all learn new things. I didn't know that was an archery somewhere close by, wherever it is. And I'm sure Chris Murphy has never been told he was the last hope somehow. <laughs> and that he's amazing. So congratulations, Chris Murphy, wherever you are in the audience. I, I now want to bring up uh, two key people. First will be Lynn Schaefer, who's going to talk about all of our projects. And then will be Philip Rouse, both of superb. Give them both a big round of applause. And I also want to thank all the people in facilities management. The campus is amazing. It looks so good. Give them all a big round of applause. Really nice. The lady in black and gold. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So I'm so happy to be able to share some of these images with you and some details about, behind the great projects, some of which are nearing completion and some of which are just getting started on campus. Uh, I want to also echo our president's comments about facilities management. And I'd like to first ask our new assistant vice president for facilities management, Len Karen, to stand. Let's welcome him. He's been here for two weeks. And I want to send out kudos to particularly Joe Rexing and his staff in facilities management for their vision, for their attention to detail, and making all of these projects contribute to this beautiful campus. So thank you, Joe, and all of my colleagues at facilities management. So I'm going to give you highlights of seven projects that are going on right now. Some, as I said, nearly finished, some just getting started. All are transforming our campus just in time for our 50th anniversary. So this shows that we have, of those seven projects, five of them are building projects and two of them are site projects, and they're happening across the campus. First project I want to highlight is the campus entrance project, which, thank goodness, is nearly complete. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So one of the key driving factors in that project was improvement in safety and access. We used to have about one accident per month at that terrible intersection at the Loop and UMBC Boulevard. We haven't had, well, we've had only one accident since it opened a year ago, and that was a single occupant in a vehicle who just got confused on the circle. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So as, as you all have noticed, we've mostly eliminated the backlogs, or the, ba the backups onto 95 and, and UMBC Boulevard, and especially the first two weeks of class. We, we have not nearly the, the traffic that we've had in the past. So in addition to the safety improvements, we also now have a more fitting entrance to this beautiful campus. We have hopefully all gained a new expertise in navigating traffic circles. Yes? <laughs> and then we have created this new beautiful gathering space in the plaza between the administration building and the uh, rack, which is more fitting to our current size than the old very small spaces that we had. Next project I want to highlight is the library pond. 
otherwise known as the Stormwater Management Facility, which addresses runoff from our campus into the bay, while in this case also providing a beautiful new gathering space on campus. Now, it was a gathering space sort of before, but it certainly was not beautiful. Uh, so we, have, we added 110 trees, 1,200 shrubs, 11,000 perennials, ground cover, and aquatic plants, 5,500 bulbs, and 10 pounds of fathead minnows, <laughs> which I'm told is tens of thousands of little minnows. And I think they're there to feed the bluegill, catfish, and largemouth bass that we also added to the pond. It's, we've added 9,500 square feet of plaza space and 300 boulders. Total project cost was four and a half million dollars. This is just another look from the other side of that plaza. Next project is the fine arts renovation, which we, <clears throat> with the spaces vacated with the opening of the Performing Arts and Humanities building, we knew that we uh, had an opportunity to repair and renovate some of the pretty bad spaces in the fine arts building. And so uh, we renovated 69,000 square feet of the total 150,000 square feet of the building. We renovated 30 teaching spaces, created a couple of new teaching spaces. 14 departments are now located in that building, 10 of which relocated to this building from other spaces. And the total project cost of 16 million was funded by the campus out of our budget, knowing that it was something that we just couldn't afford to miss this opportunity. So this is refreshed space in many of the uh, spaces on, uh, in the building. This is one of the new active learning classrooms. And this, our pride and joy, is the new mechanical build systems uh, in the building. So we replaced about 40% of the infrastructure in that building, modernizing it and providing, I guess, a much more comfortable environment. In keeping with that theme, the next wave of the backfill has been moving people out of the academic services building smartly just in time for the demolition of that building before we start building the ILSB. So uh, the registrar advising Meyerhoff scholars will be moving to the second floor of Sherman and they will be moved in this coming spring break. All right, next project is West Hills formerly known as a terrible eyesore up on the hill, we now have turned it into a beautiful campus community for our students. Uh, five buildings were renovated. One building was demolished. That was mostly because we didn't have the money to do all, all six buildings, but it worked out fine. We have added a net, in, in the last six years, a net of 200 additional beds in, uh, on campus through various projects, this being the last one. The last building open for this, is open for this fall. Five acres, 223,000 square feet of site development, um, 236 renovated student bedrooms in that formerly eyesore uh, site on campus at a total project cost of about $19.2 million. This is beautiful. Uh, you know, if anybody ever saw the, what, what it looked like before, it's amazing that they were able to accomplish this. This is a site plan that shows additional community gathering spaces, which they did not have before. Uh, so making it, again, a lovely community. All right, so now we're gonna move to the event center, which is a very exciting new facility that is now under construction. It's that great big hole at the bottom of Commons Drive. Uh, and maybe you see the beginnings of structural steel. So this arena is about 172,000 square feet. It will seat 40, about 4,700 in fixed seats and another 1,000 on the floor. So it's going to be a wonderful site, which we do not have on our campus, for things like convocation, concerts, other student life events, and importantly, intercollegiate athletic events in men's and women's basketball, women's volleyball, um, 
the total project cost is $85 million. It will be completed, it will be completed by <laughs> November of 2017, giving us time to then offer our first uh, conference basketball games in January of 2018. And we have to start thinking now about commencement, May of 2018, in this facility. Okay, here's what a, a basketball game will look like. Here's the footprint. All right, now we're gonna talk about the Interdisciplinary Life Sciences Building, a, a very, very exciting project that I'm, I know will transform the campus, take us to a new level. Uh, it's known as the ILSB, in case anybody says that to you and you wonder what the heck is that. Um, it's in the design phase right now. It will be located on the site of the to be demolished academic services building. The estimated cost of over $125 million is being funded by the state and this project will allow us to expand research and teaching in the life sciences. It's scheduled to be completed by fall, in time to actually be in use, fall of 2019. 35% of the space will be active teaching, active learning spaces. 50% will be research labs, and 15% will be core research facilities, including vivarium, cell processing services, and, and those sorts of things. Here is the site plan. You can tell it's the one at the, uh, really the sort of bottom left. Here is a view from kind of the other side, from the common circle, more or less. It's a beautiful building. This is one thing that, one of the Joe Rexing visionary uh, uh, projects that I'm so excited about. This is a view of the lobby. Uh, the, not the lobby, it's the atrium. Uh, you can see many gathering spaces for students, and I'm really excited. We applied for and were approved to participate in the Maryland Art and Public Places program for this space and there are three very large uh, panels in that atrium area and we will be going through a rigorous process this fall to select an artist to create art for that space. Here's another view of the atrium area. Here's a view of an active learning classroom the way we envision it. Here's a picture of the research labs, and you can see the, the um, collaborative spaces. So you can see right through the space into external, to the outside of the building, and people will be able to work very closely in collaboration, creating that multi and inter interdisciplinary activity that we've envisioned for this building. And that is an update on our construction projects. Thank you. Thanks, man. Now Philip comes up. And then after him, I'm asking Greg to come up and make a comment about the 50th celebration before I give it. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, what Lynn didn't mention when she was talking about that, uh, the uh, public art spaces in the new ILSB building, uh, those very large spaces, is that I was actually asked if I could produce something for that space. Um, unfortunately, I don't have enough crayons uh, to be able to do that. Now, when, when I get up and, and, and speak to you at this uh, opening meeting, I'm always reminded of the first time I did this, and some of you have heard this before, but there are new people in the room, so I'm going to tell the story again. Um, um, I, I told at the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of, of my speech what, what is quite possibly the worst joke ever told at UMBC, and uh, you, you should know that it involved both Iceland and trees, and so you can guess how bad it was without me retelling it. Um, at the time, Freeman told me not to quit my day job. <laughs> and so I'm always very glad after four years later that I took Freeman's advice and I hope to continue doing so. 
Well, thank you for that. So as we begin a new academic year, um, I really want to start by thanking each and every one of you for everything that you have done and will do for our UMBC community. And on behalf of our students, I'd like to acknowledge the profound difference you have made in the lives of our almost 70,000 alumni and the difference you will make in the lives of all those students who are joining the campus this academic year. So thank you so much for everything you do. I wanted to uh, just read to you our new vision statement that was developed as part of, uh, we developed across campus as part of uh, the strategic planning process. And uh, I was actually so struck, and I'll, I'll read it out to you in a, in a few moments, I was so struck how poignant that vision is. Um, and, and, and so appropriate given what our new students actually said, almost every one of them said. So I'm going to, you may not know it, so I'm gonna read it out to you right now, and I think you'll see that. And so here it is, uh, this is what it says, it's, it's short. Our UMBC community redefines excellence in higher education through an inclusive culture that connects innovative teaching and learning, research across the disciplines and civic engagement. We will advance knowledge, economic prosperity, and social justice by welcoming and inspiring inquisitive minds from all backgrounds. So in the short time I have with you today, I'd like to take this opportunity just to talk to you about uh, two major, I guess, exercises that we're engaged in as a university for this coming year. Um, earlier this year, as you know, we adopted a new strategic plan. The planning process involved hundreds of faculty, staff, students, and alumni um, over a period of about three years. And I'd like to thank every single person that was involved in that, whether you were involved in the steering committee, study groups, went to the open forums, commented through the website, uh, and providing feedback throughout the process. And so we're now embarking actually on the next stage of our work together, the multi-year journey to move forward with the plan. And the plan builds on our collective achievements in areas of focus that were identified as priorities, focus areas, uh, by the university community. And those are the student experience, collective impact in research, scholarship, and creative achievement, innovative curriculum and pedagogy, and community and extended connections. Now, together, we created a strategic plan that's both ambitious and comprehensive. It contains over 40 goals and strategic objectives. And at the university retreat two days ago, I shared proposals developed by the vice presidents and deans on how we intend um, to put the plan into practice, recognizing, of course, that while each of the objectives is important and, imp and an important step towards our primary goals, given that there are 40 objectives, we know that if we try to move forward on all of them simultaneously, uh, we will make little progress on any. Now, I will be seeking your feedback on these next steps early in the fall semester as I meet with UMBC stakeholders and shared governance bodies to discuss uh, what we're calling the first focus framework. But as we move forward with the plan, we remain committed to the two guiding principles developed by the campus community to, to guide our decisions over the past several years. First, we will protect, maintain, and enhance our academic program, our academic mission and outcomes. And secondly, we will support the members of our community whose hard work and commitment has made UMBC what it is today. Now the second process we're engaged in, a very important one, is our Middle States accreditation exercise. Uh, that will culminate with, uh, I think, what you would only regard as a very intense three-day site visit by a team of our peers selected by the Middle States Commission. For those of you who don't know, um, Middle States accredits our university uh, every 10 years, uh, and it's a critical ex exercise for the university. Um, we have to demonstrate compliance with the fundamental standards established by Middle States um, to receive our accreditation. But we've also tried to develop a process that's not just about compliance, but actually produces something that is in, in, in the form of a self-study that's both useful and meaningful uh, for the campus. So central to our accreditation is our Middle States self-study document that was created through an inclusive process and will be the focus of the accreditation team visit this fall. Um, 
I can't emphasize enough how important it is for each of us, no matter how we contribute to UMBC's mission, to become familiar with the contents of the self-study. The team will visit multiple stakeholders and groups across the campus community, and it's likely that we will have very little or no advance notice of who they wish to meet with. They will ask about the self-study and its recommendations, largely to determine whether or not the entire c campus community is familiar with the self-study. That doesn't mean we all have to agree or disagree about things in the self-study, but the Middle States team will be asking questions to determine whether the entire campus community is familiar with that work. I believe it's fair to say that uh, we've put a lot of effort into making the self-study readable in a way that addresses the accreditation process. And we've done that, uh, I think, by telling the compelling story of our UMBC community. And so I'm going to finish off now just by making a personal appeal for each of us to take a little bit of time to read the self-study carefully in advance of the visit. In that regard, I'd like to acknowledge all of those many people. I think there are almost 100 people, faculty, staff, and students that have contributed to the development of the self-study. There have been many people working very, very hard on this. I cannot mention them all here, but I do want to acknowledge Bob Carpenter, who's co-chaired that process over the last two years and, uh, and really got us to this point in, in, in very good shape. So finally, I guess I really can't express how deeply honored and proud I am to have the privilege of serving for a period of time as your provost. And from a personal perspective, I'd like just take, to take this opportunity to thank you all for your kindness and incredible support during the past four years. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, you know, I think I too am glad that Philip kept his day job four years ago on that advice. But in the spirit of middle states, I think it needs to be acknowledged uh, of assessment and continuous improvement. He is, he is walking the talk. His jokes have gotten much better. Give him a hand. <laughs> So I want to take a minute just to talk about the 50th celebration weekend. Before I do, I couldn't help but kind of appreciate Lynn's slide when she showed the mechanical systems and referred to them as the pride and joy. And it's serious, it's serious this because I think about the work that's happened over the last year. I think about this weekend that we're going to celebrate with the UMBC community to celebrate 50 years of accomplishment for this wonderful institution. And what we know is that the events we've already hosted that have brought in over 1,000 alums, or the events that we're going to host on the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th will bring in thousands and thousands more. And we know it's going to be a great day. We know the events are going to be fantastic. And it's because this community, the people in this room, have put forward their first step and made a great effort to showcase what's great. The thing that people won't realize on that day is the mechanical systems. They won't see the hard work that this community has put in for the last 18 months in preparation for that. And that's folks from every division, from every academic department. So on behalf of Freeman and the vice presidents and deans and my folks in institutional advancement, please know how deeply, deeply appreciative we are of that work. Give yourselves a hand for that. So we do. The mechanical systems are our pride and joy, right? Sometimes the stuff that you don't see is just as important as everything else. So there are a tremendous number of events, and I can't possibly hit them all, but that weekend of September 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th, there are some we want to make sure that you know about. And if you don't know what to do, think about attending some of these things, like the Roots of Greatness Luncheon on the Saturday, which will really feature uh, stories of some of the faculty and staff who were here in the very early days of the campus. The House of Grit Community Festival will be interactive displays featuring our faculty and students and the work they're doing every day and in the classroom and in labs. The Grit X Talks, 
that Carl Steiner has been so great at producing will feature short, you know, TEDx style talks by UMBC faculty and our alumni in areas that we're known to have great excellence. Um, on Saturday, we'll feature the men's soccer team, and on Sunday, the women's soccer team. And we should point out that last Friday, uh, the women's soccer team won their opening game in extra minutes. Give them a hand. And Pete and his team will be have their home opener tomorrow night at the soccer park, so make sure you show up and support them. Great teams, great athletes working really hard for the community. Um, there will be, of course, food all day, food trucks, and we'll have a big picnic dinner on Saturday. Uh, you know, we already heard how important puppies are to this place, right? A great puppy parade with the pep band. Uh, Freeman, our symphony orchestra, and fireworks. Uh, will really kind of be the pinnacle of the evening, and then we'll celebrate at the end with a great decades dance party that will feature records and records. Do we, call, do we say records? <laughs> Music uh, brought together by DJs who are UMBC grads and folks on the campus. So, how many people have already registered or already registered for the event on that weekend? Let's see hands. That's fantastic. Now, how many, including those, keep your hands up. How many will be registered by the end of the month? Come on, I want to see all your hands. It's going to be a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. It's great. Give them all a, a round of applause. One more round of applause. So we're going to take the next few minutes. We'll be out of here shortly after one. The, um, and so if you're late, just tell your supervisors I kept you longer. OK, you got that? I want to get all of the people who are either new to the university or have a new position at the university to stand. Stand and, and keep standing. All of them, first of all. And keep standing. And I have decided to keep standing because doing something different this year, rather than uh, my taking more time, I want this to be about people. So I want each of these people, there's gonna be a mic they'll give to you, to just say who you are. It gives you a chance so you can see a face. Hold the applause, don't be, don't be worried about speaking. We have, we're nice people. And all you gotta do is say who you are and what, what your position is, okay? Rashida Spark, and I am a human resources specialist. Let's get that mic on, it's not on, I don't think. Uh -huh. I talk softly, so. I, my name is Rashida Sparks, and I am a human resources specialist. Very good. We're going to wait. Let's wait on the applause so we can get through them real fast, okay? Keep going. Uh-huh. I am Brittany Brown, and I'm the new director for assessment, research, and strategic priorities in the Division of Student Affairs. Okay. I'm Len Karen. I'm the AVP for facilities management. Okay, if we can keep going this way and we come on around that way, it'll make it easy, okay? Uh -huh. uh, I'm Polomi Banerjee. I'm the program assistant for special events and alumni relations for the Division of Student Affairs. Okay. I'm Clinton Lewin. I'm at the Counseling Center. Uh huh. Kristen Pinto Coelho, also Counseling Center. My name is Vicky Anagnostopoulos, also at the Counseling Center. Alice Sagan, uh, Account Associate, DPS Department. Vicki Wade, Student Judicial Programs, Administrative Assistant. Cheryl Glab, Gift Officer, Inst Office of Institutional Advancement. Alex Ganser Miller, Development Officer, Institutional Advancement. Ryan Odom, uh, Head Basketball Coach. Hi, Natalie Briannis, Associate Director of Corporate Relations for the Office of Institutional Advancement, and I'm a 2010 grad. Uh, also a 2010 grad, Josh Michael, and I'm the Program Coordinator with Sherman Scholars. Hello, I'm Rebecca Don Guerra, and I'm the new Data and Events Coordinator for the College of Natural and Mathematical Sciences. Hello, I'm Tawny McManus. I'm the director in the Office of Student Disability Services. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Canale, I'm the coordinator for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services in the Office of Student Disability Services. Mm -hmm. I'm Bob Carpenter. I'm associate provost for analytics and institutional assessment. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Sarah Shin. I'm the special assistant to the provost for academic initiatives. Tracy 
Tracy Edwards, a county associate. Put the mic to your mouth for us. <laughs> Uh -huh. Tracy Edwards, the Shriver Center, Accounting Associate, Payroll. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jameson Kester, Assistant Men's Lacrosse Coach. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil Hutchinson, I'm also an Assistant Men's Lacrosse Coach. I'm uh, Ryan Moran, I'm with Men's Lacrosse as well. <laughs> He's a <the> coach. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Eric Ludi, a Technical Analyst with the Department of IT. I'm Simon Stacy, the Interim Dean of Undergraduate Academic Affairs. I'm Chris Steele, Vice Provost, Division of Professional Studies and Executive Director of the Shriver Center. All right, keep it as close to the mic so they can hear you in the back. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, I'm Candace dotson reed I'm the AVP of Communications and Public Affairs and a graduate, I'm an alum, I'm not gonna tell you the year though. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan Cousins, coming from the Bay Area and then through UPenn, and uh, I'm a new marketing intern with UMBC Athletics. Oh, good. Hi, I'm Carissa Walters, and I'm an academic advisor for athletics. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Newby, and I am also an academic advisor for the athletic department. Good afternoon. My name is Bryce Crawford. I'm an assistant coach of men's basketball. Hi, I'm Kelsey Fitzpatrick, and I'm the assistant director of annual giving for athletics. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jake Daniel. I'm the director of digital strategy and communications for the university. Hello, Jessica Wyatt, Assistant Director of Alumni Relations in the Office of Institutional Advancement. I'm Leanna Powell, 08, uh, Assistant Director of Annual Giving in OAA. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Brian Gilmer. I uh, work in uh, IT support over at the AOK. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire Eckenrod. I'm the Assistant Director for Orientation, working in undergraduate admissions and orientation. Mm -hmm. This is good teamwork. Hello, I'm Sonia Garlington. I'm in Human Resources, and I'm the Classification and Compensation Manager. Sierra Clay Valian, Assistant Registrar for Transfer Services, Registrar's Office, also Class of 2008. Uh, Michael Stone, I'm an Academic Advisor in the Honors College. He's also an alum. <laughs> I'm Alexandra Graves. Um, I'm also an Academic Advisor in the Honors College, and I'm a new transplant to Baltimore. Victoria Skinner, Learning Resources Center, alumni, I mean, excuse me, alumna, class of 2011 and class of 2016, and I coordinate first year intervention. Give her a hand for knowing the difference between alumna and alumni. That's a big, she must be an alumna. I like that. <laughs> Dave Lucadamo, business specialist in the JSET department. Brandy Darcy, admin for the biology department. Nicole Zengo, Program Management Specialist for the Biology Department and a 2015 grad. Uh, Brian Souders, a 2009 alumnus of the Language Literacy and Culture Program here um, and the Interim Director of the International Education Services Office. Uh, Joel Dwyer, Interim Director of the Commons Event and Conference Services and Arud Rana's best friend. Sarah Hansen, Communications Manager for the College of Natural and Mathematical Sciences and a 2015 master's grad. Good afternoon, my name is Mark Scott and I work as the Research Coordinator with the McNair Scholars Program. Good. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Michael Hunt. I am the Math GRE Specialist for the McNair Scholars Program. <laughs> That's yeah. right, Marhaw Scholar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dusty Kotke, Business Manager for the Student Affairs Business Services Center. Hello, Alan Yankley, uh, Chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Systems, and I'm excited about the puppy break. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stu Wennerston, Department of Naval Science, uh, inaugural semester of the Naval ROTC unit on campus. Give them a hand for the Naval ROTC. <laughs> Hi, Cindy Lutz, Business Services Specialist for the Police Department. Mm -hmm. I'm 
Tasha Hudson. I'm the Assistant VP and Controller of Financial Services. Very good. I'm Bagda Soltis, and I'm Event Coordinator for Office of Institutional Advancement. Mm -hmm. Again, Len Karen, AVP, Facilities Management. Tyson King Meadows, Associate Dean, College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Mm -hmm. Megan Hetrick, Assistant Athletic Trainer. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Vincent Valerio. I'm a new Assistant Director in the Shriver Center for the Success Program. Hi everyone, my name is Corinne Janet and I'm the new coordinator for leadership development in the Office of Student Life. Romy Hubler, coordinator for student organizations, also in student life, and uh, graduated from UMBC 2009, 2011, and 2015. Hello, Elizabeth Davis, admissions counselor. Hello, I'm Jessica Lambert and I'm operations coordinator with the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Are we finished? I already introduced myself. So if, if, <laughs> let's give them all a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And in the spirit of shared governance, do we have any of the leaders of the Faculty Senate, Professional Staff Senate, Non-Exempt Staff Senate, SGA, the presidents, the presidents to stand for me, and Grad Student Association. Are you here? Give them a round of applause. And so I did that because I, I think it's important for us to know who's here. You know, we are just big enough that it's possible for people to be around for years and we don't know who they are. And yet we're small enough that we can take 10 minutes and do that simply because it, simp it, it makes the point we are welcoming all the new students. We wish the best for those who are just being promoted. Give them another big round of applause, all of you. And so I'll take a few minutes and highlight major points from the written statement, which you can get from the homepage. It'll be linked in in the next day or so. Let me start by saying, please read the Middle States Report and the Strategic Plan. It's very important. When the accreditation team comes, they will want to know that we know what we've said and that we've talked about it. It is significant that we're celebrating this 50th anniversary. And I'll talk about what that means in terms of the evolution of the university. But let me just give you a few highlights. We have our largest budget ever, $440 million, $10 million over last year. That increase goes heavily for the hiring of new faculty and staff, for our salary increases, for academic initiatives, for financial aid, and for health and wellness initiatives. The audits have done really well. Give the, hand, the campus a hand for the fiscal audits that we've had. We've done well and been in compliance. Now. Very important. The shared service initiative did went well this year. Want to really celebrate the science, the uh, uh, our uh, natural and mathematical sciences college and academic affairs. Looking forward next year for our shared service units in both engineering and student affairs. The endowment is now up to $77 million. And if the market holds, given the commitments we've got from others, we'll hit $100 million for the first time. 25 years ago, folks, we didn't have a $1 million in the endowment. Think about how many $500 checks you need for $1 million. You get my point? So it's a big, give everybody involved in fund fundraising a round of applause. <laughs> and thank all the faculty, staff, and alumni for what you're doing. We are close to 14,000 students, about 11,000 undergrad, slightly under 3,000 grad students, between 2,500 and 3,000. But when you put that number with the number who come through the training center and others in the summer enrollments. We actually serve about 20,000 students per year. It's significant that the graduation rate is now above 60% again, up to 63%. If you add on those who have graduated from other four-year institutions in Maryland, it goes up to two-thirds, about 67%. But you can add to that another 10 percentage points for those who have graduated from other institutions, and then that takes it up, uh, you're, you're literally up by the time you finish with the 15% that are still enrolled, we can account for 90% of the students who start each year. Give us a big round of applause for that. 
We have the largest graduating class ever. We actually graduated 3,400 plus students this past year, up about 10% each of the last two years. It's significant, very talented freshman year. The enrollment looks very healthy for this coming year. Really proud of Navy ROTC. We were hoping to get at least 20. I'm told we have over 40 people. This is great. Give them a big round of applause, really. A number of achievements. Brandon Enriquez, uh, who is not here today, is our new student regent from UMBC. He's a fine young man going into his senior year with a 4.0 in economics and mathematics. Spent this past summer in research at MIT. He will represent us well. We talk about all the employers, you know, large numbers of students who already have jobs, literally almost 40% who've gone on to grad school. We rarely say it, but our PhD graduates do extraordinarily well. We need to say that. It's very, very good news when thinking about those who become postdocs at a variety of schools from Stanford to San Diego to NIH to the ones who've gone to faculty positions in engineering and science and the social sciences, literally at Chapel Hill this year, NC State, Catholic of Taiwan, University of South Carolina. Uh, some of you heard the great news about Michael Summers getting into the National Academy of Sciences. Big deal, give him a big round of applause. Big deal. You may not know that one of his students who earned her PhD here and her postdoc, Victoria, uh, actually became full professor in biochemistry at Harvard. Huge deal. Big round of applause for her. But a number of our faculty and students are doing so well. Ann Brosky, who's associate dean in arts and humanities, social sciences, has just be become an ACE fellow, and she'll be at Swarthmore with the president there this year. Sarah Shin is in the inaugural class of emerging leaders with ASCU, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. I want to commend people like Lynn Schaefer, who's become the chair of the Eastern Association of College, University, and Business Officers, Jess Myers, who's director of the Women's Center, who's become the chair of this year's steering committee on the conference, National Conference for College Women Student Leaders. And then a number of books and publications from Kate Brown, who's won somewhere between seven and nine awards for Plutopia alone, huge deal. And then Tom Cronin, whose book on visual ecology has been awarded the American Academic Publishers Award, published by, by Princeton University. Uh, and Tony Marrera, who's been appointed president of the of the, who's been appointed by the president of the Republic of Portugal as the advisor of Portugal in the world. That means if you want to get to Portugal, we'll see Tony Moreira, all right? He's, <laughs> he's in good shape. Uh, and then a number of faculty who will have international awards. We, we are in Cadenceville, but we truly are of the world. Let me just give you examples. Uh, Phil Farabau, who is um, chair of biology, will be a research, researcher, visiting researcher in France and in Sweden. Ivan Ero, who is um, uh, a visiting scientist at the European Bioinformatics Institute in England and at the Institute for Research in Biomedicine in Spain. And Kate and uh, Mayeline, uh, both Mayeline Cars and Kate Brown, will be these very prestigious Brodell Fellows at the European University Institute. And Kate and Rebecca Bowling have won the coveted semester-long fellowship at the American Academy in Berlin. The list goes on and on. Oh, yeah, Manil, who has been given this amazing award from the Rockefeller Foundation to spend the semester in this prestigious fellowship at the Bellagio Center in Italy. Somebody's got to do it, right? So you give them your sympathy when you see him, OK? Uh, but major research grants, including Balai Demas and the, and the, uh, the Joint Center in uh, Earth Systems Technology, a $46 million grant uh, to the Goddard Planetary Heliophysics Institute, led by Jan Murky for another $20 million. And the list goes on. The research forums that we had this year, one that was especially impressive, the one on climate change and the environment entitled Seeing Science, Photography, Science, and Visual Culture, uh, the very prestigious awards in the neural and cognitive systems from the National Science Foundation. There were only 18 given in the country. Two came to UMBC, uh, and we really want to commend uh, both Fauci Cho and um, um, uh, Sung Young Kim. Give them a big round, big round of applause. In their work in partnership with people 
at UMB and other institutes, and then we've got a large number of people getting funding from the UMBC UMB partnership. We actually have 14 grants at this point involving about 32 faculty across both campuses. Uh, and then the Maryland Innovation uh, Initiative Awards, those are very competitive. And we've gotten a number, we've had 21, two that are especially significant. Sue Rosenberg, who's here, in, uh, and her work on Im immunotherapy drug for cancer treatment, big deal, and Linda Dustman and Eric Small work for their work involving uh, live concert performances and interactive information. Give them a big round of applause. Sue's sitting right there. It's very, it's very nice. Keep doing it, it's wonderful. And in student affairs, very pleased that the International Association of Counseling Services um, gave accreditation to our counseling services and that the APA has accredited our doctoral psychology internship program. We are collaborating more and more between University Health Services and the Counseling Center. I want to commend all those people in Nancy Young. Very pleased because we are focusing more and more on new students, students in general, and on our transfer students who are very important. The Mosaic Center and student life staff have worked on a variety of programs involving social justice and inclusion. And uh, I'm really proud of our three new coaches, uh, Ryan Moran, in, uh, the head coach in lacrosse, Ryan Odom in basketball, and Heather Gilbert in, in softball. Give them another round of applause, please. And I commended Chad as great coach the other day because his student, Muhammad, who's an engineer, made it to the Olympics representing Egypt. And I want to commend Cleopatra uh, Burrell, who was from Trinidad, representing her country in the women's shot put. Give our two Olympic people a hand. <laughs> You've heard about capital projects. When you put all those projects together and what we have over in the research park, we're talking about over three quarters of a billion dollars since 2000. Uh, and at the same time that we've been increasing the square footage, we've had a 15% decline in our carbon and in reduction in the net carbon emissions. We are focused on climate change. The IT people can be very proud that we're one of the first universities in the country to become connected to the internet with a 100 gigabit uh, per second. Uh, and, and what's significant about that, that it's only about 75 out of 4,000 in, in around uh, America. Uh, and in terms of engagement, we all hear about the challenges that we face with unrest, with social injustice, with inequality. We are working on many fronts. The National Conference for Imagining America that focuses on colleges and universities dedicated to using the arts and humanities and design in addressing the, the issues that we face. We, we chaired that conference this past year. Uh, it is significant that Craig Berger is now the chair of the American Democracy Project Steering Committee. David Hoffman is now on the board of Imagining America's National Action Board. We have the NEH funded grant with College Park involving Baltimore stories and we will be doing that throughout this year looking at issues in life in Baltimore, Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences College is leading us and heading us and working with the other colleges in looking at ways through the courses that we teach, through workshops, to help us to talk about the challenges that we face in America. Starting with Baltimore, but wherever we are, it's important that we think about how to support our students and our faculty and staff as we work to make a difference in, on these issues. Uh, the, the new book experience focuses on just that. It is not in my neighborhood how bigotry shaped a great American city, and that's the city of Baltimore. So if you've not read it, we'll be discussing that with our new students. Let me end with this. You heard me talk about shared governance, about the notion of people. We are, for the seventh year in a row, the only four-year institution in this state listed on the Chronicles list of great colleges to work for. That's your doing. Give yourselves a big round of applause for that. <laughs> you know, our mantra this past year and will continue to be that we do a hell of a job with limited resources. And we will be pushing to get more money. People like Delegate Jones, our own alumna, uh, and Senator Case Meyer are working with us. We will be getting more money per student because even as we talk about the facilities, as we talk about first rate research, innovative teaching and learning, engagement, it takes resources to support. Whether it's the research, because the building is not enough, we know that. The teaching and learning to support our students, to support faculty in the classroom, outside of the classroom, supporting students with all the challenges that they face, whether in the counseling center, in the residence hall, the transfer students. And so we'll be talking more and more with legislators and others about the fact that this is a jewel. 
50 years ago, people could not have imagined having this concept become reality. And so when I look into your faces, I think about the notion of dreams fulfilled. How many people in America, like Anna, had come from families as first generation? Let me just ask you that question. How many in here in the room are either first generation college or in terms of the first in your family or the first in your family among a group? Raise your hands. Just raise your hand. Look around the room. And even in this educated room, large numbers, two thirds of Americans still have no college education degree. And so I want us to think about the fact, as Anna said, in essence, of those to whom much is given, much is required. That there are so many children in Baltimore who cannot read. That students will come to our campus for the first time as first generation college or with other kinds of challenges. That diversity issues from LGBTQ to women to ethnicity to income are all challenges that we face. And it will be up to us as the leaders to let people know they are not alone. It is an honor to be president of UMBC. Thank you all very much. And so now we want to have the singing of the alma mater, and I'm sure the music will begin so you won't have to hear my voice so much. Would you stand? And remember, at all the events, it's important to teach our students that when the alma mater is playing, nobody leaves. It is respect for us that we stand in respect of the alma mater. So I'm sure there must be music coming. Ha, 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 ha,